Granahan from WPRO, and we're excited to bring you the very latest edition of our series on debates. This one is being called Fishing for Answers, and we're so happy that you're here. We're streaming live on 630WPRO.com, and we have a great panel today. Obviously, the fishing industry is a huge part of Rhode Island, our history, and things to come. So we have great representatives of the industry. We're going to start over here on my right, your left, with Richard Fuca. He is from the uh, Rhode Island Fishermen's Alliance. He's the president. Also, Representative Joe McNamara from the fine city of Warwick, where I was raised. Tom Kutcher, our Narragansett Bay Keeper from Save the Bay. And also Tina Jackson, and she is the president of American Alliance of Fishermen and their Communities. She wins the longest title. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for being here. We'd like to start off. We have a great audience, too. We're at Rhode Island College at the Student Union with air conditioning, so we thank them for that. Yes. And uh, we want to just go right down the panel. We have a variety of topics we want to cover in this debate series, as we're calling it. And we want to start with Mr. Richard Fuca. Just yes. tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Tara, and thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and talking about uh, Rhode Island's one of Rhode Island's oldest uh, historical-based industries, the commercial fishing industry. Um, the Rhode Island Fishermen's Alliance is the state's largest adv advocacy group, largest by membership. Um, our membership includes everything from quahoggers to aquaculture folks to uh, our largest seafood um, companies, um, folks like Town Dock, Seafood, uh, Sea Freeze. Um, we've got quite a, quite a membership, and we're very proud of that, and we're proud to advocate for our fishing community, um, which makes this, this event very, very special. I appreciate you having us. Oh, we're glad you're here. Representative? Good afternoon, and thank you to WPRO Radio uh, for establishing and having this uh, quorum this afternoon. Uh, last year, I introduced legislation that would make Rhode Island style calamari, the official state appetizer. It passed overwhelmingly in the House and teetered on the last day in the Senate. But it basically was recognizing uh, Rhode Island's most commercial, uh, valuable commercial fishing product. We have uh, 125 uh, vessels that are engaged uh, in the squid industry catching 23.5 million pounds. We have two major processing plants in the state that process this product and ship it nationwide and internationally. And uh, I hope to get into the value added aspects of this product. The fishermen came to the state house without a lobbyist. They didn't have any paid witnesses they humbly asked that we recognize their product, as did the restaurant industry, two very successful industries in the state of Rhode Island that uh, were looking for an opportunity to brand Rhode Island products and expand our economy. We're going to find out what happened to that bill, because that's the big question. OK, Mr. Tom Kutcher. Uh, I've been a Narragansett Baykeeper for uh, close to a year and a half now, um, third generation Rhode Islander. Uh, basically, my young adulthood, uh, I think I have a pretty unique perspective, uh, spent, uh, worked at the Fisherman's Co-op, uh, lived with fishermen, surfed with fishermen uh, down in Point Judith. Uh, feel like I'm part of the culture, um, but then went on to uh, uh, go into science. I worked uh, for a while at the Narragansett Bay uh, estuarine Research Reserve. Uh, then I worked on contract, um, worked on contract uh, with the Office of Water Resources at DEM. Uh, so I, I, I feel like I, I can see both sides of the picture. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. And uh, you know, save, save the Bay's perspective on fishing is you know we're worried generally about the implications for the health, use, and species sustainability of the Bay. Great, thank you. Um, Tina Jackson, um, again, president of the American Alliance of Fishermen. I'm probably one of the very uh, few women who uh, have the opportunity to not only work in the industry, but advocate for the industry. Um, I've worked very closely with Richard Fuca on many issues, um, not so much at the State House. I do a lot of uh, uh, federal advocacy. I've taken many trips to Washington um, regarding legislation that's being proposed uh, down in DC, not just for Rhode Island, but for the nation as a whole. 
Um, my main focus is the Northeast Fisheries. Um, I am a very grassroots orientated organization. Um, we do have a large ground fish uh, um, uh, membership. Um, I'm not nearly as large as Richard is, but we both work together very closely and we are on the same page and regarding our advocacy um, for better legislation, not only for the state, but for the country as a whole. Um, I found myself in a unique position six years ago to uh, take an offshore trip uh, for a fluke during the middle of January, um, 80 miles offshore, and um, I instantaneously fell in love with this industry. And the more I began to work on the boat and the more I saw the overregulation that was occurring consistently, um, not only at a state level but at a federal level, um, I began to realize that what is being, per, the, the public perception of the fishermen is really very, very much misunderstood. Um, I had um, that public perception of the fishermen um, that many of, of uh, us do have, did have, and I sought to change that public perception. Um, we have a very valuable resource in this state. We have wonderful, hardworking men and women in this industry who go unrecognized on a regular basis. And the regulations that come down and hurt us continuously um, really is where my focus is at. Again, I'm very grassroots orientated. I don't have a large membership, but um, I am very proud of what I do and that I am one of the few women who have had the opportunity not only to work in the industry and lobstering and ground fishing, but also advocating in DC. All right, well, thank you so much. That's our introduction of our panelists. I'm going to try to break it down and maybe simplify it and oversimplify it a little. And, and if Richard would uh, start us off here. We hear a lot. We see the stories. We follow the news. Oh, and, he, and you, Tom, have a great op-ed in the paper today, apparently. So read the Providence Journal if you can. <laughs> Just timely issue there. Are we oversimplifying by saying it's this group over here that wants to over-regulate the fishing industry versus the environmental folks that want to, quote, save the bay, and they're worried. Is that oversimplifying, or is it, is it that easy to say that, obviously, save the bay and other uh, environmental groups say, we can't overfish, we're losing population, right? You said you used the word worried, we're worried about the bay. But Richard, how do we sustain this industry? Is it in jeopardy? Well, Tara, first of all, you, you have to simplify things so people understand them, and, and, and in the, the short of the long is, um, you know, you have to look at the issues um, of what's put in place. Now, Representative McNamara mentioned uh, lobbyists. Um, lobbyists get paid big money to say certain things. National Marine Fishery Service, uh, which is in the Department of Commerce, um, un under their own guise, have indicated that we have quite a few species that are harvested in Rhode Island um, that aren't overfished. Um, what the counter to that is the environmental groups that lobby and spend a lot of money to keep those harvesting numbers at a bare minimum, in this case to New England. So we're always held at bay with small conservative numbers to keep our fishing industry whole. That's, a, that's as simple as I want to make it for the listeners and the viewers. Um, when you start to look beyond those, those issues, when you look at the state of Rhode Island in simplistic terms, and I like to think of myself as an advocate that works on domestic issues like calamari. Um, I, I want to make Joe McNamara an honorary vice president <laughs> of the Rhode Island Fishermen's Alliance. His numbers are spot on. His, I, I mean, I'm so impressed with the amount of, of, of uh, stuff he put together um, to, to nail a simple bill and talk about our number one species in Rhode Island, which is squid. And a lot of, a lot of Rhode Islanders a majority of the Rhode Islanders just don't understand that our fleet uh, survives on Lalago longfed squid. All right, let, let's let Representative McNamara, uh, you know, bring us behind the scenes of what happened I, at the State I House. It was that, late at know, night. Talk, talking, talking about regulations and sustainability and numbers, a good analogy for the average person that I found very helpful, if you were looking at the squid catch, the analogy that uh, cod and lobster <laughs> would be like harvesting a hardwood forest, whereas the squid is so sustainable that it's more like mowing your grass with the clippings. 
They reproduce twice a year. Geographically, we are right in the middle of the migratory pattern between North Carolina and Canada. Uh, in terms of what happened to the legislation, the last night uh, of the session, as I said in the House, uh, the vote was 70 to 3 with a few usual dissidents who don't support anything and used a lot of re negative rhetoric. But uh, actually, I got half of the Republican caucus, which is three out of six, that did support the bill, and uh, three naysayers. So it passed in the House overwhelmingly with a lot of support. Uh, the last night of the session went very late. The Senate put, put it on the calendar. We passed a number of bills, and uh, the Senate adjourned without taking action on that particular bill. Was that, in your mind, on purpose? Well, I don't want to overanalyze the issue. Uh, the last nights of the session can be very hectic. Uh, I will give them the benefit of the doubt, because we are going to be back uh, next year with a stronger economic message uh, that hopefully is recognized, and I'm certainly the Senate is uh, pro-business, and this is one of our state's largest, it is the state's largest commercial fishery business. Although squid, uh, they're not attractive like lobster. <laughs> it takes our chefs in Rhode Island have done a tremendous job in developing a, a recipe for calamari that is internationally renowned. And sometimes I think the average Rhode Islander doesn't realize the potential uh, of this commercial fishery. And one of the salesmen from Seafreeze really mentioned uh, a little story that impressed me. He had just come back from Salt Lake City selling calamari. And he said, we sell this product as what's known in the industry as a white linen tablecloth appetizer. It's marketed like a fine wine. Then he went on to say that California has a much larger coast, obviously, has a larger squid landing. When the wholesalers in California want to entertain an important client, they call Sea Freeze in Rhode Island and ship out Point Judith Squid. Why? Because it is a superior product to any other squid caught anywhere in the world. It's more tender. It has certain uh, aspects to it that are highly, highly marketable and sought after. Let, let me just say, you, you took a lot of jabs and ribbing for this bill, and we're not going to spend the whole debate series on calamari, but what, what you are, I think most people here are saying is this was a very important, this could have meant a lot of money to Rhode Island. Would you, can you put a figure on it at all? I would let Rich put a, a figure on it. He's more familiar with it, but it cost the state nothing. And it was a way, just introducing the legislation, it was mentioned in every newspaper in the mm. United States, in the Huffington Post, that positive uh, message about free advertising products, free advertising. So I don't think you can place a value on that. Could you, but, Rich? And then I'm going go oh, to go. Oh, Tara, I, I'll I'll throw some numbers at you. I mean, if we're talking about an industry that employs six, seven thousand individuals, an industry that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and you start to slice that up into terms of calamari or squid, you're talking about a lot. You're talking about millions and millions of dollars, and it and it. Um, you know, we've got three, at the top of my list, is three major players uh, it, for, with, uh, involved in the squid industry in Rhode Island, Sea Fresh, Sea Freeze, and Town Dock Seafood. I, you know, it, it's, for that bill not to pass in the Senate, um, I, I probably see it a little different, differently than Joe. Um, for the life of me, uh, there's, two, there's two committees over there that are well rehearsed and well studied um, when it comes to the fishing industry, the commercial fishing industry. Uh, they're both chaired by Senator Sasnowski. She's got a seafood marketing collaborative committee. She has the environmental and uh, uh, agricultural committee. Both of those committees have worked on issues in and out of the, f the fishing industry. They've been that 
the, the committee members on the Seafood Marketing Collaborative have been to Seafreeze. Why you would let that bill sit there uh, at 10.30 at night? I mean, fishermen are fishing around the clock. Mm. Uh, why you let that bill sit there is beyond me. Um, just so a uh, point of note, we did invite Senator uh, Sosnowski to this debate, but I did not get a response. So maybe we'll follow up on that. Absolutely. Uh, I want to go to... Um, Tom here, you are the Narragansett Bay Keeper, which some people might not exactly be familiar with exactly what you do. But when you introduced yourself, you said there are several um, issues that you're worried about, about the bay. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Well, did I say that? Well, uh, well I wrote it down, <laughs> and I put little quotes around it. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, 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 are, what are we overfishing? Um, Rich said that there are many species that are not overfished. What, what are, what's in danger? What's in jeopardy? Well, I can give you one example, uh, is, is our Manhattan. So it's not, it's not a local overfishing problem, but they have been overfished uh, as of last year, uh, mostly down south. And uh, you know, here is a, a species that's at the base of the food chain, uh, supports many of our other fisheries, not specifically the squid fishery, but many of the, the larger fisheries. And there's a single company in Virginia that, that takes most of them uh, before they can ever make it up the coast to support our recreational and commercial fisheries up here. Our lobster fishery included, uh, it's used as bait. Um, and, uh, you know, w when we see that there is a potential, that we could potentially have an effect on our local fishermen, a positive effect on our local fishermen, um, an effect on the ecology of the bay, um, then we'll weigh in. And, and, you know, so we did weigh in on the, this past amendment that, that looked to reduce the amount of fishing. We weighed in, you know, we thought there should be a larger reduction. We thought that, that the fishery down in, in Chesapeake Bay should be reduced more, that our, our bait fishermen should be able to catch more menhaden and, and, and still be able to reduce the amount of catch by, you know, 50%. You could remove reduce the amount of, of fish by 50% by reducing what, what they're taking in North Carolina, because they really are taking the lion's share, something like 80% of all Manhattan. And where does that stand now? Um, they, they reduced uh, the total take by 20% across the board, pretty much. I mean, that's, that's the simple answer to it. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But mm -hmm. we will weigh in when we feel like there is a threat to our bay, to the people who use our bay, including the fishermen. Or, or to a, a particular species that, you know, is part of our heritage or part of our bay system. And Tina, you're, you're on the water. You're actually doing the job. Yeah. And, uh, you Pretty know, much. growing up, I always thought, you know, you always heard we would go down, we would buy the lobsters off yep. the docks instead of going to the supermarket or what have you. I still do that. And um, these folks are some of the hardest working people you'll ever see. Um, and. Well. I, I always was led to believe growing up here that they could make a lot of money, but it was putting in tremendous hours. Is it the same now, or have the regulations really cut down the, econo I, I, the let's, economy? I'm going to answer to a couple of different things. Um, okay. I, I'm going to respectfully uh, disagree with Mac uh, Representative McNamara. Go ahead, and, Tina. <laughs> that's what I do best. I am the most politi politically incorrect woman you will ever meet. I pride myself on that. <laughs> um, first, um, regarding Tom with science and, and commerce, uh, NOAA, who regulates the fishing industry across the country as well as here in the Northeast, uh, obviously is within the Commerce Department, admittedly says their science is wrong. They can't get it right. There are many times that more species, more poundage of a species is landed than the government has actually assessed that is out there. For instance, butterfish. Let's just be hypothetical about it. Uh, the government says there's 200 metric tons of butterfish in the stock for the year 2013. Well, last year we landed 300 metric tons. How can that be? How can we land more than what the government is saying is out there? And there's a lot of political um, push and pull behind this. This is an extremely political issue down in DC. It's an extremely political issue here in Rhode Island. It's because the government doesn't get it right. And they never have. And we see this consistently through many industries, not just the fishing industry. Um, Tina, they Tina what did you want to disagree with Representative McNamara on? Well, um, it's, uh, you know, I, give me just a quick second on yeah. that one. Um, I thought Rhode Island personally was the largest uh, squid producer. And, um, uh, but I was going to respectfully disagree that while squid is, yes, one of Rhode Island's largest um, uh, 
uh, landings that we utilize here in the state, not only for food and revenue, um, but there are, are many other species out there that hardworking fishermen um, want to bring in. For instance, um, the state could, we'll, we'll take winter flounder for, for instance. Um, there's a lot of winter flounder around right now. The state um, could allow us to la uh, land maybe six or 700 pounds a day um, for our state boats. Um, what's happening is, is that the state is refusing to give us more fish. Um, when they can do so, they're only allowing us to land 50 pounds. Um, when many boats, many state boats, are catching a couple thousand pounds throughout the day and the course of the day. So what are we doing with all this? I was respectful. I, 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 there was a disagreement that I had with him, but I, you'd thrown me off track, Tara, and I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. I, I really wanted to get down to um, um, the science and commerce and that it's a very political issue and that squid really isn't just our only resource that we, we pride ourselves on in the commercial fishing industry. Let me just ask you then. You, you, you just said the state boats versus our boats. Can you clarify that? You said the state boats are taking the chunk of the No, 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 no. There's flounder. a difference between state boats and federal boats. Um, state boats have to work within three-mile limits. They work within the three-mile federal limit. Um, anything over three miles, you have to be federally permitted. Um, uh, right now, winter flounder is very abundant. It was shut down for approximately three years in the federal government. Um, prior to that, there was no allocation. We could bring in whatever we caught. There wasn't a limit. Um, the federal government decided that it was being overfished and we went to zero. We literally was closed for three years. It now is reopened, which is a catch-22 in a lot of different ways because it's just such a highly complex issue. Um, many of the state boats that are out there fishing near Block Island are literally catching a couple thousand pounds of winter flounder a day when they do go out, weather permitting, obviously. The state is saying, well, we are not going to give you more winter flounder to bring in um, at this point in time, we will work on that for next year. Well, what does that do to our local fishermen and our state boats at this point when they're still out there catching it? Many, many fishermen will just stay away from that area, which really is harmful in two different ways. It's harmful ecologically to the stock, because when a stock becomes overabundant, and Tom, I, I think, will agree with me on this, they stop spawning, and they stop reproducing. And, and the food sources that they have become very limited when a stock is overpopulated. So that's why getting that science right through the federal government and utilizing commercial fishermen to do that, real fishermen, along with real scientists, is, is one of the key components to allowing this industry to thrive instead of continuing to overregulate us down to whittling us away to basically nothing, which is exactly what the federal government has done. Um, last year, and I know this is a little crazy, the state could literally give us more than 50 pounds a day. They can do that. They will tell you that no, Atlantic States recommends, it's not law, they're not bound by law. Atlantic States is recommending that no, we keep it at a minimal limit and this is your quota for the year and this is all you can have. Well, that's not true. It's only a recommendation. The state's argument will then be, okay, well, commerce will come in and shut us down. Well, that's no longer prevalent. That's no longer an argument for the state to have because, believe it or not, when Obamacare was upheld, the individual mandate and Medicaid expansion was upheld under the Commerce Clause, a state refuses to implement the Medicaid expansion. This is a precedent now. The federal government cannot come in and punish a state for failing to implement that regulation. That precedent can be set into any industry. So the state no longer has that argument that commerce can come in and shut us down. The state, I believe, I believe, those who run the fishing industry within the state of Rhode Island um, refuse to open their ears and open their eyes to what is really uh, a vital economic resource and a natural environmental necessity to keep our e ecological system out there thriving. You just can't have all this fish. And I'm going to say it, we are overpopulated with just about every single species we have out there. Sea bass, winter flounder, fluke. Lobster is a problem right now, but the reason we have a problem with lobster is because we're overpopulated with cod and uh, striped bass. They're eating all the lobster. So you can't have all of these predators and, ver and all of these prey and expect it to work out naturally. Nature will always take care of itself. And that's one of the things that I really try to instill in people. When the federal government stepped in, they made a huge mess of the fishing industry and they continue to do so today. Let nature take its course. The fishermen know what they're doing within reason because there are bad apples, let's face it. But 
a large majority of the fishermen would never, never, ever take away their own livelihood. It's been going on for 300 years. They know what they're doing. They re we really are true environmentalists. We don't want to see our fish go away. Thank you, Tina. Representative McNamara, I'm not going to put you on the spot as the only uh, politician in the room, so That's to speak. That's fine. But can you weigh in on that when Tina is saying that just let's keep uh, the government out of First of all, in of terms of, uh, I think her uh, comment was regarding a reference to California's Squid Landing versus Rhode Island. Tina is correct that Rhode Island is the Calamari capital. Okay. Uh, squid Landing on the, of the East Coast. We land 54% of the squid that is consumed on the East Coast. And I believe we also have more fishing squid licensing than any other state okay. on the East Coast. So she is 100% correct. See, I should know that, you think? In, <laughs> in terms of uh, federal micromanagement of our fishing area, uh, I support 100% uh, local management and the fishermen that I've met and I've talked to uh, are very aware of uh, establishing a sustainable catch. So I agree, less federal regulation could help the state. Unfortunately, DEM is uh, not present today in this forum. I will say- They were invited multiple times. <laughs> at the uh, Calamari hearing, they supported the marketing collaborative and they further stated that they are in the process and this was uh, approximately two months ago, that they are in the process of establishing a Rhode Island brand. Like we have Rhodey Fresh Milk, well, an, a national Rhode Island brand, and that the uh, Calamari legislation is a perfect marriage with their rollout of a Rhode Island brand of fish that is exported throughout the United States and consumed because I think that we have a very, very internationally recognized high quality of product in our fisher fisheries and our processes do a great job. So less fe federal regulation, I would support it 100%. Absolutely. Joe, jo, not, to, not to interrupt, but you, you made a, a really great point. You, you pointed out a marketing brand that's coming out of uh, the marketing seafood marketing collaborative charged by the Rhode Island Senate um, and headed by Director Coit, um, it, it, I'm, I'm mind boggled that that a bill that would have married to that marketing collaborative so perfectly sat in the Senate at at the eleventh hour like that. Just want to make that point, but you know you you bring up a good a good point that we're working on a brand. Um, but yet an appetizer can't make it through the Senate? For the life of me, I don't understand. I agree, it's Rich. Someone idea. said, Representative, uh, if we look at states that have successfully marketed their assets and their products, like that group of states in the Midwest that had all of the pigs and hogs, they said, you know, they came up with pork, the other white meat. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I can see it now, calamari, the other white meat. No. Uh, so... There is a way to market your assets. And in Rhode Island, one thing we're very good at, and that is becoming overly negative and not recognizing our successes. Our early founders in this state built on the natural resources that were available to them. And that's when our state was probably the most successful. They utilize the rivers and streams to build factories and produce products. We have a great natural resource in our fisheries, and we can do a better job marketing and managing it. Um, excuse me, Tara, just real quick. Um, wasn't there um, uh, the Kennedy Salson Act, actually, there is federal funding there that was supposed to be directed over the last 20 years for, for specifically states to market their seafood. And unfortunately, NOAA misspent the money. I believe it was a couple hundred million dollars over a certain amount of time. I, I don't have the numbers directly in front of me, but I'll... I'll try to be uh, as close to the mark as I can. And that money from the Kennedy Salston Act was supposed to go to the fishing industry in all the states to help us promote 
our seafood, fresh, locally caught seafood, because the best seafood and the most healthy seafood for you is the least traveled fish, as Rich will tell you. That's on his, that's on his card. Um, and uh, fishing is literally one of the last natural, healthy food sources we have in this country. We went from uh, small farms in the 80s down to factory food farming. I mean, this is all really a, a, a continuous effort to consolidate um, and allow bigger companies to, to grow or, or micromanage, as, as uh, Representative McNamara was saying, and literally put those small boat fleets out of business. And, and it boggles my mind, this money that was supposed to be utilized for the promotion of seafood, we could have utilized, if, they, if the Senate had passed that calamari bill, we could have moved on to Rhode Island flounder. We could have moved on to southern New England lobster and had a lobster war with Maine, you know, we, because I believe personally that our lobsters are superior to Maine lobsters, and I've been told so by the people that I sell to on the dock, so I'm just taking their word for it. <laughs> but there is federal funding there that really could be utilized to help bring income into the state because for every dollar that is landed um, um, through the fishing industry, I, I, it used to be four dollars. I'm going to go to six dollars. Six dollars is generated through the local economy, and for every one person that works on the water, there is a statistic of 6.6 .6 people working on land. So when you shrink the size of the fleet, as has has happened, not only do you hurt the fishermen, but you hurt the local economies as well. And within the state, and that's why we're continually last, is because we just can't seem to get a simple bill. I want to just uh, reintroduce everyone. For those folks that are joining us, we're streaming on 630WPRO.com. You're listening to Fishing for Answers, uh, WPRO series debate. Tina Jackson on the end there. She is the president of the American Alliance of Fishermen and their communities. We also have the Narragansett Bay Keeper representing Save the Bay, Tom Kutcher, Representative Joe McNamara from Warwick, the city of Warwick, and Richard Fuca, the president of Rhode Island's Fisherman's Alliance. And Richard, I could see you were chomping at the bit or bait, so to speak. Well, I'll do all the really bad fishing jokes. Well, Tara, I, I just want to make a couple of quick points. Um, and one of them has to do with testimony um, uh, for Joe's bill. Um, it, was, it was great testimony. It was done in Italian. But I really would like Representative McNamara to explain that testimony if we have time. But back to my first point. Um, Wait a minute. Representative McNamara, the Irish guy, did his testimony he in Italian? Had a, he had a cute little <laughs> old Italian man there um, that gave absolutely vent the best testimony I've ever heard. Um, well, you it, said the bill was so simple, and this, yeah, this is what is, is so aggravating. This, this was, is Sometimes we get these bills, and we're all trying to figure out what exactly we're trying to say. Just a quick point simple. to federal regulations. Um, the Senate, Rhode Island Senate, um, well, there's nobody in the, there's nobody in the General Assembly uh, that will argue, um, oh, maybe there aren't enough federal regulations. Everybody up there knows that their fishing industry is uh, heavily scrutinized by over federal regulations. So much so that uh, the Senate President, Teresa Piva Weed, initiated the Seafood Marketing Collaborative Committee, Seafood Committee. Again, they recognized the overzealous federal stuff and saw a need to protect our homegrown fishermen. And, um, you know, again, the House um, has, you know, done above and beyond its due diligence for a simple bill, but without having all kinds of fancy committees, um, and, and Representative McNamara has done it in his own right. Back to the testimony um, yeah. from that, uh, you know, I'd love you to talk about that, John. Uh, former Representative uh, DeLuca, who represented the uh, city of Cranston, came in. He's in his 70s. And his testimony was very simple, very eloquent. eloquent. He said, I received a letter from uh, Veranzano, who first discovered Narragansett Bay, and I would like to read it. And the letter was in Italian. He read it in Italian. And then he spoke of the beauty of Narragansett Bay and its abundance. And he said, with this legislation that recognized this abundant bounty, that he's very proud that he had the ability to come into Rhode Island and the experience, and that he hopes that the bill passes. <laughs> it was simple and elegant. And he, he mentioned, he said, I never thought I'd see the day where calamari would be recognized to this extent because when he was a young boy growing up 
It was very limited in this community. There were only a few people. So it, it was really, really exciting and well done. And I also would just like to echo uh, Tina's point about local uh, sustainability and marketing. Currently in Rhode Island, we have a situation where markets are, and I don't know what, the, maybe the baykeeper knows what the issue is. When you go in to buy steamers, uh, soft shell clams, markets are advertising main steamers. Now, I, being from Warwick, grew up core hogging and digging for steamers and know the difference between Rhode Island steamers, taste-wise, are much, much sweeter than the main steamers. But here we have independent grocery stores such as Dave's and I think the Stop and Shop, they're all selling main steamers. So I don't know what the issue is. I well, know Connecticut Point is Let's let Tom weigh loaded. in on that. Are we low yeah. on steamers? Are we low on our own clams? Well, I, I think, yeah, there's not a, there's not a, and, and I don't know, you know, maybe the, the commercial guys know better than I, but I don't think there's a huge uh, commercial fishery for our local steamers because they're spotty. Um, and and they shift around with the shifting sands. They get overfished fairly quickly in in given areas because you know the, the, the guys who do fish for them will go there and and, and then they, they won't replenish for a couple of years. They don't move, so you know they're sitting ducks. And and you know call hogs have done much better I think than the steamers have. I agree that our local steamers I get them myself. <laughs> are much better tasting than, than the uh, main steamers. But that's that's infuriating if you're going into the market and you're seeing well, main steamers as opposed I, yeah, to Rhode Island. So it, is, is it just you're not making the money off that's, it, that's Tina? That's what I think. Um, I, and, and I don't know too much about the uh, Quahog industry uh, personally, only you know just a few guys that I do know. Um, I believe size went up. Richard, you may agree with me on this one. A couple years ago, they increased the size limit. Therefore, um, landings go down. Well, uh, but, yeah. and, and that may be part of the reason why we're seeing outside sources. As with lobsters. Um, there's, yeah, there's a little more to it, though. Um, and to save the base credit, you talk about, you know, Joe's talking about steamers. We're all talking about steamers. Uh, Tom mentioned uh, Manhattan um, and the biomass of Manhattan that shows up. Um, in the Bay every year. I, I think if you take a step backwards and you think about Save the Bay and think about where the Bay was 50, 60, 75 years ago and where it is today, I think when you can have a healthy debate over the environment in our Bay, one thing that stands out is the Bay is extremely healthy today versus yesterday. And Save the Bay has been a major player in that. So when they start to worry about Manhattan stocks and, and Manhattan coming into the bay um, and who's catching it and who's not catching it, that's, that's their job. Steamers are no different. Mm -hmm. To Rhode Island DEM's credit um, and Save the Bay's credit and Fisherman's credit, everybody gets credit for being great stewards. Um, because we're able to celebrate a healthier bay, um, DEM also monitors uh, the most productive areas where steamers reproduce and grow. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, Joe, I'm, I love steamers, oh, yeah. and steamers grow, and steamers go. And um, when we don't have them, we have to we have to substitute cool. with second best <laughs> mains uh, uh, soft shell clams. So um, you know, there's a lot of things to pay attention to, but you have to pay attention to both sides of the coin. I think is the important point. So as far as economically in the industry in itself, Richard. Is, are we sustaining it? Are we going to have future generations of families staying out on the water and making a living this way? Well, that's a, that's a great question, Tara. That's, that's, that's the question that keeps me up at night and uh, aggravates my wife because I can't fall asleep worrying about it every night. Um, you, you know, if, if people just were simplistic, and I know we're getting into the big world of politics here, but... Um, if we had less lobbyists, Joe mentioned lobbyists, um, if we just paid attention to the simple things of what actually is happening um, and not pull things too far to the right or the left, um, we wouldn't have to worry about, in this case, fishermen. I am very, very concerned with how much pressure is being applied to the fishing industry right now. The fishing industry has been extremely resilient. Um, you know, fishermen grow into generations, and, and this generation that's here now uh, pays pays attention to the, the the mountainous task of regulations on a daily basis. Can we go fishing? Can't we go fishing? Where can we go? 
they've adapted extremely well to that, but it's a never ending cycle of regulation that strangleholds fishermen or our community uh, because of an, of an environmental surge of lobbying power. That's, that's what plays at hand. When here. money comes into play. Who's making the money? The lobbyists. Uh, the lobbyists, most of the time. I mean, some of the biggest, po most powerful lobbyists. Um, you know, I, I argued ex a, a, a real, real tough issue in Rhode Island. It had to do with a, the type of management that distributes quotas to individual fishermen. Uh, there was a handful of fishermen that wanted a catch share system in Rhode Island. It was endorsed by the Environmental Defense Fund. And, you know, they, you have to run an advocacy group against a high paid lobbyist um, and, and talk about the pluses and minuses of that catch share system. It's a monumental task, Tara. And, um, you know, meanwhile, people are trying to make a living. Um, it's tough to do. Um, actually, that brings me to, um, actually, Richard actually helped produce this with Brian Loftus, is the Truth DVD. It's a local documentary done by a third generation fisherman, Brian Loftus, who in fact, sadly, may be the last generation in his family. Um, there's not a lot of young fishermen out there. You have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy permits in a boat to get into the industry. Um, there's not a lot of sons and daughters. Uh, who are taking over the business because of that strangulation effort um, by Environmental Defense Fund, Pew, uh, the Ocean Conservancy and Nature Conservancies. A lot of times they're overzealous groups that we feel um, are trying to, you know, help the industry, but people who don't work on the water and or who are paid lobbyists to talk the talk to our legislators don't understand the real value and the reality of being a fisherman and working on the boat. I think we, I think I had proposed take an environmentalist to work day um, down in DC, <laughs> down in DC, and How'd that go over. I, you know what? I think um, you know what? I can't remember what representative it, what, it might it, it might have even been. Um, it might have even been, uh, 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 God, I can't remember what staffer, I was going to say, it might have even been Alan West staffer who says, do you think that's a really good idea, Tina? Will they come back? I said, <laughs> I'm running, to, you know, we're going to throw all the environmentalists and, lo and lobbyists off the boat on the way back in. Um, but I really, I, I, I do have um, some information over there. Uh, one um, is done by Food and Water Watch, which is a, uh, uh, a wonderful environmentally grassroots orientated group um, called Fish Incorporated, and you can find it anywhere online. Um, and the Truth DVD, I do have some here with me today if people would like to have one. Um, and you can log on to Rhode Island Fishermen's Alliance, I believe, and um, you can purchase one online through there, or anyone can contact me. Most people know how to get in touch with me, and barely. And easy. I also want Tom to weigh in from Save the Bay, since we're talking about environmentalists. Just explain to us what role Save the Bay, uh, Tom, if you don't mind, plays into this. Um, and if anyone has a question, raise your hand by all means if you want to jump in on this, because we did talk about sustainability, the health of the bay. Uh, we're not going to tag you as the one environmentalist on the panel, because it's tough to, you know, there, there's so many federal regulations. There's a story every single day in the paper about fishing regulations. Are we over-regulating the bay here in Rhode well, Island? You know, fisheries management is so complex. You know, there's state management, regional management, national management, the science, the pressure from lobbyists, the pressure from fishermen. We stay out of it. We try to stay out of they it. They do. We, you're welcome. Well, and I say the Bay actually works very well with the fishing industry. I've, I've had a good opportunity myself to, to sit with them, and they actually helped promote um, the Truth DVD, um, and it was in specific regards to the Catch Air program that came down a few years ago. So, Tom, I think, yeah. I think Save the Bay, you know, continue on, please. But yeah. they are one of, they're not the large, I don't want to say radical because I hate that word. Uh, I, I, they're, they're not the large uh, money-orientated environmental groups that uh, are really pushing us out. That's not the same thing. How do you keep politics out of it, though, as far as your organization is concerned? Well, I, I was going to get to that. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you know, you can't keep politics Excuse completely me. out of it. You know, when we weigh in on Menhaden, there's it's a little. There's Will a you little explain bit what that is? I'm sorry. What Men when Men you're saying Menhaden? Menhaden. It's for pogies. the folks that are listening. Pogies, the things that you snag and you catch bluefish with. Okay. That come up the bay. They're they're. I've been um, fishing in a while. They're, they're, <laughs> these are these are pelagic bait fish. 
they're migratory. They migrate, they migrate up from the Chesapeake Bay area. They migrate up the coast and, uh, and our, our sport fish and our, com our commercial, you know, our larger uh, uh, commercial fish chase them up the coast and migrate up with them. Okay. They're very important fish. Okay, great. Uh, so where was I? Oh, talking about politics. Um, we have not historically weighed in much on fisheries unless they directly affect the bay. It's, it's too complex of an issue for us to spread out into. Um, we are very concerned about it, um, but we have to this point tried not to um, delve too deeply into it. You know, one thing I will say is that we believe that the science, you know, we want good science, just like everyone else does. Um, from a scientist's perspective, um, you know, I, I know a lot of these scientists, and, and believe me, you know, they're science geeks. You know, they, wanna, they want to find the answer. They don't have an agenda. You know, they're looking to find the answer. It's not them. And, um, and these guys, they've spent six to ten years in college, and, and uh, yeah, I, I hate to see them being put under, under any pressure from either side. You know, and when and you say who 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 are you specifically talking about? The the scientists that are working under scientists. Save the Bay. Yeah. Okay. No, not not oh. at Save the Bay. We don't have a fishery scientist. So I'm talking about you know our state scientists, our federal scientists, uh, and and non affiliated scientists who study fisheries. You know, that these are in guys, it for the science and not these guys. Not the these guys are looking for answers. And, and you know, Save the Bay. Anytime we weigh in on anything, we we look to the science, not the not the politics. You know, I talk to some of my fishermen friends and we'd start talking about, I'd start talking about the scientists, the, the science, and sometimes say, oh, it's all political. You know, and, but you know, the, the politics is added on top of the science, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, uh, and, you know, it's my personal feeling, I don't know if I speak for all the state of the day, that, that, you know, the best available science has to be used. Even if it's not great, the best available science is the science we have to look toward. You know, our medicine isn't perfect. But, you know, we, we listen to our doctor, you know. The doctor says, stay off your knee, stay off your knee. If you don't stay off your knee, it might get worse. So uh, that's my personal opinion on it. And this is in conversations I have with my friends who are fishermen. You know, I, I try to instill that a little bit. You Rich, know? you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with it more. Um, I can make a point. If you take a look at the scallop industry, the ocean scallop industry today, I'm, you walk into Dave's Market, you walk into any supermarket, you see scallops, ocean scallops available. And they're available at an extremely good price, um, great price to the fisherman, great price to the consumer. That industry just about died in New Fairhaven, New Bedford, almost eliminated, a handful of boats left. To Dartmouth UMass's credit, a um, couple of scientists up there, um, were, they were able to prove that uh, an extremely overabundant biomass of scallops existed on George's Bank off the coast of Massachusetts. They were able to prove to National Marine Fisheries Service, unfortunately through the court system, but they did uh, prove that uh, an extremely lucrative biomass existed. If you look at why the city of New Bedford or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has the highest producing fishing port um, in, the, in the country, in the nation, um, it's because a biologist by the name of Brian Rothschild and uh, uh, Kevin Stokesbury um, were able to prove what existed. And they did that with exactly what Tom was speaking of. Call them biologist geeks, call them what you want, but they, they knew where the scallops were and they knew how they could prove it, they were there. And, um, you know, they, they put that industry on the map. And I, I remember doing stories on that years ago. It was, yeah. it was the 90s. And, boy, that dragged through, though, every political arena there was, the courts. So it was, much it was so, exhausting. So much so, Tara. Um, you know, the federal government now has taken over their survey study um, you know, there's always, where there's a will, there's a way, and they were able to come up with a configuration on proving and mapping on the bottom of the ocean how many scallops existed. And then it only got better because their mapping uh, process, they were able to count fish inside these mapping areas as well. So, uh, 
yeah, best available science is, is what we live for. And that's why fishermen um, involve themselves um, above and beyond with collaborative research. You know, they want the biologists on their boats. They want to produce. They want to show um, how environmentally sound the ocean really is, how sustainable individual fisheries are. Um, it seems like the minute you unload that science on the on the shore side, it, it gets caught in the undertow of of politics, and away it goes. Mm. I'd have to agree with Richard on that. Part of the problem is, well, I, I despise that word, best available science. I despise it, and I, I tell you why. Because once the government, again, stuck their hot little hands into taking over uh, um, their own surveys, um, they sit in boxes for five years. Well, fish change year to year. They migrate, they grow, they die off, they get bigger, they get smaller, they go up and down. It's like anything in nature again. And it's not the scientists. It really is the government bureaucracy that comes into play. And that is part of our biggest problem, is to take away the government bureaucracy and put it right back into the hands of the scientists and the fishermen together so that we get that best available science and we really do know and have a better idea as to what we can fish on there's also an uncertainty uh, matter there's a large uncertainty factor that's proportioned into what we can have um, and every single time um, the government has wanted to shut down a major industry such as cod monkfish the scallops fishing fishermen have pulled together and proved the government wrong and we were able to continue to fish on those stocks because they just can't get it right. My famous saying is, when was the last time the government ever told the truth about anything? And I'm speaking federally. <laughs> on, a, on a federal level, really, it, there's always a political agenda sometimes attached to a lot of things. And unfortunately, it causes, um, it causes problems between people who are really uh, attaining towards the same goal. Now, Representative McNamara, I'm not going to have you speak to the federal government, okay, well, but thank sticking you for locally. Yeah, for specifying the federal government. Just keeping thank it you, local, Tina. as we'd like to say. Uh, yeah, um, Tara, you hear it all the time. Keep, keep government out of our business. Yeah, and it's, I would just like to uh, thank, this was a very simple bill. No big paid lobbyists came in, but the uh, Rhode Island Hospitality Association, Dale Venturini, uh, came forward with her members, a chef that volunteered to come in and explain how calamari is made. Uh, the Rhode Island Fishermen's Alliance and Rich came forward. But the most moving testimony, and this gets back to what Tina has stated earlier, we had captains come in that own squid boats. Very simple, hardworking individuals very straightforward, who gave, and I love short testimony at the State House. It doesn't have to be long to be effective. But we're extremely effective in saying, this is what we do. And I liken those fishermen, they're almost like the product, the squid that they catch. They're very below the surface. They do a tremendous job, uh, work very hard. They don't ask for much from the state or the federal government, but they came in, strongly supported this, and in my eyes, when we look forward to putting a positive brand on two of Rhode Island's biggest industries, legislators, and I hope the Senate listens to these individuals next year when they come forward, that we have to do a better job promoting and branding uh, two of Rhode Island's best products. And this September, we have the uh, first national Rhode Island uh, food tourism convention coming into Providence. The Food Channel called at the end of the session. They are very interested in this legislation. So healthy eating and food promotion and product promotion today is very important to economic sustainability. And uh, I would ask uh, the viewers, please contact your Rhode Island State Senators and tell them that you want Rhode Island style calamari <laughs> to be our state appetizer. I know Thank what my you, Halloween Tara. costume is this year. I'm going to be Rhode <laughs> Island style calamari. I just figured out I'm going to be Representative McNamara's bill with like some <laughs> tentacles. You Can you just in about a minute, if that's possible, Tom, just wrap up your feelings uh, about the fishing industry today, where we're going and save the bay? Uh, sure. Uh, 
again, Save the Bay is interested in the health of our bay and the health of the ecosystem of the bay. Uh, we take an ecosystem approach to bay health. Um, so we don't key in on single fisheries necessarily unless, they, uh, unless we perceive that there could be a threat to the ecosystem itself Great. or to the, the species itself. And Tina, we're going to wrap up in your, your final words. Um, eat locally wild caught seafood, period. Really. Always local, least traveled. Um, I won't get into my famous farm raised salmon and uh, 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 non, uh, 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 menage on that one, but um, I, I, I like to thank Tom too for really advocating um, for sustainable fisheries. Do you as have well future generations going to stay out on the water? Well, let's, you know, there's a couple of youngsters, one of them sitting in the room right over here, who's uh, going to hopefully help keep it going. I really hope so. We really need to keep our Rhode Island fishing industry going. Thank you, Tara, again Excellent. for this. Oh, well, my pleasure. Very and, and Richard, want to give you a final say, too? My final thoughts, um, thank you very much, WPRO, for, for putting this on. Um, just when I lost all hope in the General Assembly, along comes Representative <laughs> McNamara. <laughs> I am completely perplexed. but. Um, please, uh, your local senators, ask them about the calamari bill. Um, ask them to understand about Rhode Island's number one species, number one's producing uh, species, um, and, and let's get this calamari bill nailed. All right. We'll appreciate the panelists, obviously, thank you so much for your input. I know it's an emotional uh, topic for some folks. This is the way people are making their living here in Rhode Island. So we went fishing for answers. So hopefully you enjoyed this program. And you can catch it 630wpro.com. We appreciate it. The staff at WPRO, obviously, uh, they do all the hard work. They do all the setup. So thank you for that. Sometimes we forget to thank the folks that are behind the camera. So we appreciate them. And uh, stay tuned. We'll have much more on the WPRO Morning News with Gene Valicenti coming up next week. But you can catch this entire debate series on our website, 630wpro.com.